Okay, so this is a presentation. This is a continuation of the presentation I did uh, a couple weeks ago on uh, some of the things I did uh, during the solar eclipse. And uh, the last uh, presentation I did, I talked about my QRRS beacon and some of the data I got back from reverse beacon and uh, you know some of the interesting results. I got back in this presentation, I'd like to continue on that and talk about something I call the solar tracker. And basically what it was, it's something I used to track the sun during the eclipse and make measurements of various aspects of, uh, of the sun, of aspects of uh, sunlight. So uh, I, uh, here's the agenda. So I'd, I need to talk about the background and the configuration. And it's I've got about a total of about 40 slides and majority of it is around the architecture because you really need to understand that. Otherwise, the data will make no sense to you. So you really need to, to understand what I'm doing, why I'm doing it. And then once you see the, the data, it'll uh, make sense. So as always, you know, take what I say with a grain of salt, uh, uh, old physics guy who hasn't done this stuff in years and years and years, and uh, uh, some of it's a little bit rusty, so I may say things that are not completely right, but so uh, so take things with a grain of salt. And as with my other presentation, I, you know, I this came about from last year at uh, Hamvention, Hamsai talked about uh, what they're planning to do to, during the eclipse, and that just planted the seed in my head to say, hey, you know what, this is a good opportunity for me to do some uh, experimentation. I showed this slide before, and it just gives you a sense of the timeline I worked with, because I started this back in December of 2023, and I worked on the beacon. That's about four months before the eclipse. And I worked with my beacon for about three months. And then a month before the eclipse, I got this, <laughs> I, I don't know, what inspired me or how my mind works but a month before the eclipse i decided to go and build this tracker and so in that month i had to go and do all my cad drawings 3d prints none of this stuff is stuff which i pulled off of the internet it's all custom stuff everything i did was so i had to build the cad drawings myself 3d print i had to do the milling the, the pcb prototypes milling everything i had to do I used uh, three processors here. I used an STM32, which uh, I had to figure out, I'd go back and figure out how to do programming and what the I.O. structure and the timers and all that kind of stuff. So I had to figure that out because that did servo control, that did the data collection, it did the synchronization so and uh, communication. It was like the brains. Then I had two SP32 with camera modules so I had to go back, figure out how they work, and they were a pain in the ass to, to, to figure out how to work because there's a whole bunch of problems, not, I shouldn't say problems, challenges with these things which nobody talks about. So I had to figure those things out on my own and work around it. But basically I use those for the camera and for, it's got an SD um, slot, so I use that to store the data. Uh, a lot of it I used a I squared C communication. I had to figure that out. Then I had to figure out ESP now, and I'll explain why I had to do that. Then I had to build a pinhole camera. So all this stuff I had to do in a month. And so what happens when you try and do uh, too much in too little time? Well, Murphy comes, uh, pays you a visit, and you end up, you know, putting the cart before the horse, and things go wrong. And so in in light of this, I created something called my Murphy's log. And I talked about that before. And basically in that log, I'll show you what worked, what didn't work, what uh, some challenges were. So I keep track of it as I go through my presentation. So let's not let's get get into the architecture um, of the uh, uh, solar tracker. Now I realize that I can put this into full screen mode and show it like this, but I like doing this because I like to jump around and because uh, I know what slides are coming up. So I, 
one of the first things I had to do was figure out, okay, what am I going to measure here? In the Beacon project, well, I was this is the uh, uh, spectrum here, electromagnetic spectrum, going all the way from gamma rays to uh, uh, radio waves. And uh, before, when I was at uh, school, in grad school, a lot of my work was in gamma rays. That's where I did a lot of study. But uh, so I, I had to decide what to go and measure. And so as part of the uh, Beacon project, I measured radio waves and propagation. So that part of the spectrum got covered off. So I decided to, you know, I would measure ultraviolet light, visible light, and infrared light. So that was the three goals to measure the, that, um, uh, that type of radiation coming off of the sun. So here's a little video I'm going to play. And as I'm talking, you'll see this is an early prototype. And you'll see me moving the uh, light here, and you'll see it tracking the light. So I had two large servos on hand, and I decided to use those for azimuth and elevation control. And you can see one of the servos there. And that's a servo controlling elevation. There's another servo here mounted below this, and that's doing the azimuth going left to right. And as well, I had uh, create this tracking jig. Now, I this was all over the internet. A lot of people use this this jig, so uh, I just borrowed that from uh, other people who uh, use that to build solar trackers. And on that, I mounted. Uh, you could see the little black dots there. Th those are infrared diodes, and also I had photo resistor sensors. So each quadrant here has got a pair of sensors. And that's allowed me to do the tracking as well, collect data. I, as with any project, you got to throw in a solar cell. You know, it's uh, the solar cell was not used to power this because I'm sure someone's going to ask that. Did you think about using the solar cell to power this? No, it's a sensor. I use it as a sensor. It just doesn't generate enough current to drive um, servos. So it's it's being acting uh, as a sensor. Then I had a. a an ambient light and an ultraviolet light sensor. They were both I squared C devices, and you could see them here. I've got a better picture where I'll zoom in. I'll show you all the sensors. Then uh, what's not shown here is the ESP32 uh, camera modules. In a subsequent slide, I'll show that. But I had one mounted to the face of this, which will be taking pictures of the sun, and it's got a solar filter. Uh, attached to it. So that would be one device to taking pictures. Then I decided, <laughs> you know, a week or two weeks before uh, the eclipse, I decided I, I'm going to do a pinhole camera. So I had to just bring this ESP32 cam module for the pinhole camera, and I'll explain why I did that and what happened there. But uh, I used another ESP32 cam module for my pinhole camera. Then I had a um, a temperature sensor, which is not shown on here, which you'll see in a subsequent slide. And I mounted a metal plate to it, and I thought I could use that to measure the thermal flux coming off of the sun. And that's, that's just the heat, how much heat is delivered per square inch of a, uh, of a surface. And I had a main STM32, which is this board here, and that's my, the brains of the whole thing. So that's measuring, capturing data. It's tracking the sun. And it's syncing up data with the ESP32s. So here's the concept of my thermal flux. And this is important. This is why I said, you know, you have to understand the architecture. Because when, when you see the data for this, it'll make sense. So what basically, uh, I've got a uh, temperature sensor. And I've got a plate in the shape of an L bracket attached to it. And this is the side view. And here's the top view. And here's the temperature sensor. So the idea is the sun shines on this plate, heats it up. And I can measure the, the heat that's on this plate via this. And I can measure the flux. So I'm measuring how much thermal energy is delivered to this uh, um, surface as a function of like per square inch. And I could track that as a function of, of um, time as the eclipse goes on. So that's in theory what I want to do. Here's the actual equipment. 
This is the actual final setup here. You could see here's the ESP32 module here. You could see the solar filter. It's uh, uh, attached with masking tape. Real high tech en engineering here. You could see the thermal sensor here. I got a better picture, a much close up where you could see the sensors. There's the IR camera, the ultraviolet ambient light sensor, solar cell, and you could see the IR diodes there. The jig. There's the battery controlling it. It's a LiPo battery. And I had to put a little uh, um, display showing the voltage because you don't want to dis discharge your LiPo beyond a certain point because you'll damage it. I built a, also a jig to mount a, a cell phone camera so I could take pictures. I didn't have a good, good camera, nor did I want to use a good camera because I was afraid that I might uh, damage it. So uh, here's the pinhole camera, and I've got a, a, a another slide, which I'll show what uh, that's doing. So here's some miscellaneous thing. Here's a video. So this is the 3D print of the turntable, which gets mounted to this base plate. You can see the servo there. And you can see the plate, the attachment plate there. That's You can see a hole in the middle there. That gets attached to that plate, and this servo rotates it to get the azimuth. And this is just the board, um, the prototype board the, for, that I used uh, to control it. This is what the STM32, you can see the footprint for the STM32. All my sensors connected in here. Um, up here was I squared C, servos attached up here, and voltage uh, input regulation here. I had to put two voltage regulators. I had to have a 3.3 volt regulator and a five volt regulator. The five volt regulator, needed a huge heat sink, not a lot of huge, but it needed a heat sink because the current draw from these servos got this sucker to get quite toasty warm, not warm, hot, where you could burn your, your fingers on it. So here's a zoomed in picture of all the sense, sense sensors. You can see the thermal uh, flux sensor here. So that's the metal plate. And I uh, Jerry rigged a little PCB board here to attach the temperature sensor to it. And so the idea is to measure the thermal flux, you know, hitting, striking that plate. Here's the IR camera. Here's the uh, uh, UV and uh, ambient light sensor, solar cell. And uh, here you could see the four uh, IR uh, diodes. And they just basically, it, it's, it uh, as, more IR light shines on them, they uh, they allow more current to flow through. Same thing with the uh, photoresistors. It's a it's a photoresistor. As light shines on it, the resistance drops, and therefore more current flows flows through it. Here's the ESP32. It's a W Rover module which has a camera built in, and below this it's not shown. You can't see it. But underside of this, it's got the SD card that I, that I use to store uh, the, the data from the SDM32 and to store the pictures that the camera would take. Here's a side view of it showing the sensors. But here you can see the servo. So this servo is controlling the, uh, the elevation. It's swinging this uh, up and down. And below this, this turn turntable is not properly attached, so it's you can see it hanging off. It just, for the picture, I just kind of put it on the top to get the picture, but there's a servo mounted at the bottom that attaches to this round turntable, and that causes it to rotate left to right, uh, the azimuth. So for the pinhole, what I wanted to, to do was, if you took a a set of uh, pinholes and you projected it onto a screen during the eclipse, what would happen is that during the eclipse, these little circles you would see, lighted circles, they would become half circles or quarter circles as the eclipse progressed. So I thought, okay, you know what? I'm going to attach that to the side of my um, a tracker and I'll be able to capture that. Well, that didn't work out very well because number one, I had issues with the focal length of the actual image and the ESP32 cam. They have different focal lengths and I had uh, issues with that. But the biggest issue was the weight. Now, uh, some of you may have caught this, but if you look at the axis of rot rotation, it's going through here. 
there's a servo and uh, the axis of rotation is there. So it's rotating about this point. Well, you've got all this weight at the top here. And before I had this board mounted to the actual top at uh, one point. And uh, this thing was just drawing an, um, uh, an immense amount of current. And I couldn't understand why until one day just dawned on me, I created a hammer. Basically, all the weight up at the top, and you're swinging this hammer. So the amount of inertia you're swinging is huge. And as well, if this gets, you know, it goes down, and it's, you know, uh, pretty much horizontal, gravity is pulling all that weight down, and it's a huge moment. And this poor servo is just sucking back current. Sometimes it pull one and, one and a half amps of current it'd be pulling. And my uh, poor little um, uh, uh, LM, uh, what's it, 7805, I think they're rated for like one amp or two amps. It was getting hot. I could fry an egg on it. And the other thing was the wires. These wires, you know, you'll notice the wires are mounted at the axis of rotation before they were mounted below. And it was acting as a spring. And it would it would impede the motion, so there are lots of issues around this, and so I had to. This is why I decided to do a separate pinhole camera because I just couldn't do this here. So uh, my Murphy's log, I have two things. One is you know to reduce the moment arm of the tracker. Next time, use a stepper motor instead of servos. Servos just can't do this. Stepper motors would probably be there far more more efficient at doing this and i don't know what possessed me to use cat5 wiring for this because it's solid wire and it's basically a spring i should have used i don't know why i didn't use softer wires but hey live and learn right so here's the concept of of uh, the pinhole camera so um as i said there are two focal lengths and what i had to do was put a a screen between the pinhole, so the pinhole's here, so the light gets projected from the pinhole, gets focused on this screen, it's a translucent screen, and then put the camera at the back of it to take pictures of that translucent screen, because the focal lengths were quite uh, uh, different, because at first I wanted to mount the camera at the pinhole, but the focal lengths are different, and it just wasn't working. So here's, you could see that the pinhole camera broken apart. Here's the translucent screen, which fits inside this box. And then on top of this, I have a card that gets taped it, and that's got, got the pinholes. So this goes inside, and you could see it sticking out here. You could kind of see this side of it sticking out there, and that's the uh, pinholes there. And inside at the bottom, I've got my ESP Cam 32 module now originally i wanted this to be connected i squared c back to the um stm 32 and what i found out was this esp32 cam modules if you're using the sd card and the camera there are no free io pins you can't use io pins and i spent i spent days trying to figure out why i squared c was not working with this device and it turned out what the pins didn't allow it. I couldn't use it. So I couldn't use uh, I squared C. So hence, I had to use this protocol called ESP now. And it's a proprietary um, expressive protocol that runs over Wi-Fi. And so I used that to communicate between the two ESP32 uh, modules. So to add to my uh, Murphy's log, ESP boards, if you're using them, make sure you know that they've got uh, IO free IO pins. So here's kind of the logical arc architecture of what I did uh, of, uh, of the, the tracker itself. So I've got my STM32, which is the brains, got all my analog sensors. These are the photoresistors, the um, uh, IR diodes. They were all, uh, the, the STM32 is measuring voltages from those uh, devices. Then I had some digital sensors, which are I squared C connected. They were the ultraviolet uh, and uh, ambient light, the IR 
camera. That was all connected through I, I, I squared C. Now with the IR camera, what I found out painfully uh, was that it's got, it's got a huge, it's taking a picture. And so I've got to pull all that data and it's like three or four K uh, kilobytes of data. You've got to pull across I squared C. Pulling it across wasn't a problem. Okay, transmitting that to the storage device was a problem because there's something called the, the Arduino HAL, the uh, hardware abstraction layer. And with whenever you program anything using Arduino uh, speak, Arduino um, uh, code, you know, you're going through this Arduino HAL. And that HAL, it's, I shake my head at it. It makes things easy for someone who doesn't know how to, how to program a, a microcontroller. But once you want to get in and do, you know, more meat and uh, potatoes, it blocks you from doing it. The Arduino HAL, the buffers are too small for transmitting data. Now, I could have sent, you know, 100 bytes at a time, you know, sent it, and then, you know, 30 seconds later, another 100 bytes and so forth. The problem is I wanted this to be in real time. I want to take a picture, transmit it, take another picture, transmit it, take another picture, transmit it, and I couldn't do that. So I ended up having to ditch the IR camera because I just couldn't do it with this architecture. I could probably have worked around it, but I just didn't have enough time. By the way, can you guys still hear me? Am I still on? Yeah, no problem. Dave. Yeah. Oh, okay, good. So, uh, so that's that's the digital sensor. So uh, I had my ESP32 camera module, which has got an SD card. So via I squared C, I would send it a signal so, to say, take a picture. Here's data. Store it to the card. So this is the camera that had the um, uh, shield, the filter, taking pictures. And then I had the pinhole camera connected to ESP uh, now. That's a Wi-Fi protocol. So the SDM32 would tell this camera, this module, take a picture, save data. Then this module will tell this module, take a picture, here's some data, back it up. So I had the data stored in two places. Call me paranoid. So next time, ditch the how. Use bit, bit, bit bang, you know, I squared C. And I've done this before, you know, back when I built, I used to build rocket flight management systems. I That's what I, I all my stuff, I wrote completely at, at the metal. Here's a DS pick, which doesn't have any libraries. There's no cool libraries to go use. You have to go and write everything from the ground up. And here I have... Uh, uh, a, um, an XP module, a GPS module, a um, IMU, and uh, I, all this I use. So I could do this. I just didn't have the time to do it with this project. So what worked well was the, you know, the analog sense sensors. I was able to get those working, store the data. The digital sense sensors worked well as long as the data was less than 128 bytes of data. I think the total amount of data I was saving was of, of the order of about 52 bytes or 50 bytes. So it, it wasn't a problem sending it across. So one of the things I did was uh, this, this what I thought was clever. Here's the, the data I would send across. This is called a structure and it's just a, a you group a set of uh, variables together. And I've got, you know, this thing called the header and you can see it here. This, this is just what was stored on the uh, SD card. It stores this thing called a header. It's the minute. So it says, you know, I sent you a signal to take a picture. Here's my data at one minute, you know, at uh, five seconds. So this is just the start of uh, the program. So I would note the time it was started. And from that time, I would add a minute, five seconds to know this was the data. And so I got, uh, th this is the data got stored. Uh, one of the things I did, which was in hindsight a really good thing, is I also stored the servos uh, placement, the azimuth and position. And it was a good thing I, I stored this because this came in very handy. But the reason I did this header, and this header was nothing more than I just took this 
these numbers and I shifted them to fit in a in a um, uh, a sixteen by uh, six sixteen bit variable, so a uh, uh, an int. And what I did was I I used this header, which is just this timestamp shifted, and I, I would timestamp the image. So when a camera takes an image, it would use that uh, that um, uh, number. So when I sent this data, this line of data to the SP32, I'd say, take a picture. It would take this number, take a picture, and assign it. And the reason I did that, because what I wanted to do was say, okay, this line of data goes with that picture. So I could see what was going on. That, in theory, that's what I wanted to do. This is, by the way, this is the SD card listing. This is the direct, direct directory listing of the SD card. So you could see the images being stored here and the numbers and the uh, the uh, header values. So enough said, let's move on, then look at the results. So here's the setup. Uh, here's the actual um, uh, tracker. It's actually running here, it's live. It's uh, tracking the eclipse. And I put it in a table, here's the pinhole camera. And I put it at the front of the cottage we were at because we had a really clear view. Uh, and I didn't have to juggle it around. I could leave it here. Um, here's my Kona pickup truck. And uh, just as I show you the data, I showed this before. Let's just make sure we're all on the same page when I talk about C1, C2, so forth. So in terms of the eclipse progressing, this is the eclipse progressing along in time. And as the moon touches the sun, that's called the first contact or C1 contact one. And where I was, that happened at uh, 1.58 p.m. Then as the moon moves across the sun, once it ends, it, it completely covers the sun. It just kisses the end of the sun here. That's called the second contact or contact two, C2. And that happened at 3.30. 13 p.m. Uh, uh, at, in uh, Leamington. And then at that point, you had a full eclipse for about two and a half minutes. And the time that the moon moves off the sun and sunlight starts coming through, that's called the third contact. That's called C3. That happened at 3.16 p.m. And then this, the moon continues to move off. And once the move moves, completely off of the sun, that's contact C4, that happened at 4.28 p.m. So drum roll, here's the data. So here's the data from the IR sensor. The, so this is the infrared diode. This is from the, um, uh, the light uh, photo resist, resistor and the solar cell. The red trace, so this, I've also showed the contact points. Here's C1. Here's C2, C3, and here's C4. So the orange trace is the IR light coming in. The green trace is the solar cell voltage. And the blue trace is what the, uh, the visible light that's coming from the, the photodiode. The data has been normalized to 100. That's why it looks so neat. All the these were not, I didn't get values of 100. I took the values and I normalized them uh, to be 100 so you could see how they vary. So, so one thing to notice is right during the eclipse, everything drops out as you would expect, hooray. So that was what we would expect is that it would go dark and all of our sensors would go dark. However, if you notice, it's shifted a little bit. And I suspect what it is, that's my clock. Because I was using the SDM32 timer uh, to measure the time, the minutes, and seconds. And I think that was off a little bit. So I think that's what's causing that problem there. But you know, notice everything drops at the same time, which is good. The other thing, notice the IR sensor here is less affected by the um, nearing, getting near to C2. It, it continues trugging trug along, and it doesn't start dropping off until well into C2, or, or closer to C, C2. Same thing with the solar cell, the green trace. 
you know, it holds out the drops further than the IR or the um, photoresistor sensor. So solar cell is definitely a good sensor to use to, to, to track the, uh, the, the sun. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's everything. So, so the success sensor data worked really well. I was really pleased. I got some really good sense sensor data. It matched up with the, the cycles, C1, C2, C3. You know, it matched up really well. I think uh, something to improve is maybe use a real-time controller. Uh, uh, an R, RTC to track what the real time is so that uh, I'll get better timing as opposed to using the Arduino clock, or the um, STM32 clock. So if, if we zoom in on this data, this is where it gets kind of interesting. If we zoom in right near the eclipse, we see some, some strange happenings here. So we see again, the orange is the IR light. And by the way, the IR is what I use to track the sun. That's, I, I use that to actually track the sun in the sky because I found uh, using the IR sensor, it was far more accurate in terms of tracking. But if you look at the IR data, it gets all gnarly. And that's a technical term, gnarly. It's getting all gnarly here, you know, like it's getting gross looking here. But the other sensors are quite, you know, looks quite smooth. So what the hell's going on there? And it's just before C2 and just after C3. What the heck's going on? So I kind of scratched my head, but I thought, okay, you know what? Let me overlay. I got the servo data. Let me overlay the servo movements to see what the servos were doing. And sure enough, you could see the servos moving right during this period. So during this period, I think what's happening, it was trying to acquire the sun. It was losing tracking of the sun, and it's trying to uh, acquire it. So the, the PID I use to, to um, move the uh, array, it wasn't very good. And so I got a lot of jitter, a lot of noise, and you could see it as well here. It's trying to pick it up. Now, the interesting thing is I did notice... I would periodically go and look at the um, the uh, tracker. Just after the eclipse, I went to it to make sure it was still working, and I did notice it was moving around a little bit, and I was trying to lock onto the sun after it went completely dark. So I think that's what's happening there. It's uh, uh, it's tracking, but it just means I need a better algorithm for tracking it. And again, it's a time-based thing. So one of the things to do as well as step promoters is to use a well-trained PID to actually track, to move this thing so it moves smoother and it's not going to have as much jitter in moving. So if we take a look at now, this is the data from the ambient light and the ultraviolet light sensor. You could see the uh, ambient light is the blue trace. So you could see it's pegged and then it drops down and uh, comes back up. It's got a little bit of gnarliness here. I don't know if that's because of the tracking or just noise from uh, the, the light, but uh, I'm sure if I was to do some, you know, uh, low pass filtering of this data, I would get much smoother data. But the interesting thing to note here, if you just ignore this noise, this gnarliness noise, as I said, if I was to do this again, I could probably just use a some kind of low pass filter here to get get rid of that noise. But if you look, this is linear. This is the ultraviolet. The orange is the ultraviolet light. It's linear. It's pretty much linear here. It's a straight line. So ultraviolet would be a really good way to, to track the, the sun in the sky during an eclipse because it's it got a nice linear path and using a PID with that becomes uh, uh, much easier to go and travel. The reason I think this gets pegged up here, see, it, it's like a flat line on both sides, is because I think this sensor here is just getting sat saturated. There's so much light coming off of the sun that the, the sensor can't handle it. It just, it's uh, too much light and uh, it hits its, its limit. So this ambient light sensor is probably not a good 
sensor to to measure you know the sun with it probably need a better uh, sensor now keep in mind these sensors I went I paid like a few dollars for for these this was not stuff I spent a lot of money on the the uh, IR camera I think I spent the most on it was about I think it was about 40 bucks 30 40 bucks to get that the rest of the sensors were you know dollars to go and get um so the other thing was my my thermal flux so I looked at my thermal flux and I got some good data from the temperature so I converted the temperature of the uh, of the I converted the data to a, to a temperature of that plate. Now, at C1, you could see the temperature is, you know, pretty close to 25 degrees Celsius. So that plate got nice and warm. And as it uh, the sun gets covered up, covered up, it drops right down to about six degrees. It goes from 25 degrees to six degrees. So the sun heats the plate up to, you know, 25 degrees, so almost about the 20 degree difference. Now, the problem is, I realized this after the fact, is that I can't use this to measure the flux. Because at this point, you know, this the flux here should be zero, but it's not. So what it's measuring here is the ambient temperature of the air. So I need to have a sensor mounted maybe below the uh, the apparatus in the shade somewhere to just measure the ambient temperature. And so once I've got the ambient temperature, I subtract it from this data, then I get the true flux. So this data is meaningless. It's just measuring temperature of the plate and it's uh, uh, to measure the flux, I have to subtract the temperature of uh, the ambient air. So to, if, uh, to do this again, I need to get a, a ambient air uh, temperature. So one of the things, uh, you know, as I was driving home, <laughs> I almost drove off of the road, I thought, hey, you know what? Is it possible that I could measure the apparent speed of, of the sun? Because I've got azimuth elevation data from the servos. I got the rate of change of azimuth and elevation. Can I calculate the speed of the sun moving? Well, the apparent speed, the sun is not moving. It's the earth that's moving. So it's an apparent speed. Can I measure it? And the way you would properly do that is you'd have to pinpoint, you know, get the X, Y, Z of a point in space of the sun, one point, and then a, a moment later, get the same point at another point in time and calculate the distance, the vector distance between the two. And knowing the time, you could calculate the speed as a vector. Now, I couldn't do that because I didn't have any kind of reference point. I could probably jerry-rig it because, uh, you know, because I could do something relative. But I, I didn't, I didn't measure the uh, where zero was, and I, I couldn't. It, it just, I felt it would be uh, a lot more difficult to do it. So I thought, is it possible that I could? take the azimuth speed vector and the elevation speed vector. So take the speed of the azimuth of the um, uh, tracker moving up and down and the speed of the tractor moving left, left to right. And they should be at right angles. Just take the vector uh, addition of both of those and see what that is. Could I do that? So I thought I would try it, but first thing you have to figure out what is the what is the sun's apparent speed at my location. So this varies based on location on the Earth time of year. So I found this chart. This guy measured it at his location somewhere in the states, as uh, you know he measured the time and uh, during different times of the year he measured the speed of the sun, and he found it varies sinusoidally between 15 and about you know, just 13.75 or so. It varied um, so many degrees per hour. And that varies over time of a year. So in the summer, it's got one speed. In the winter, it's got different speed. So I thought, okay, you know what? Let me try and do a back, back of the envelope calculation. The Toronto sunrise on that day of the eclipse was 642. The sunset was 755. That means I got 853 minutes. 
uh, in that time frame that it was uh, the the sun was vil visible, and assume the sun moves 180 degrees uh, in one day, which is about right for this this time of year. It's about 180 degrees, so it moves 180 degrees, 853 minutes. It's about 12.7. 13 degrees per hour, which is not too far off this this chart. So it's it's a reasonable number. So if I plot that data, this is the actual data of the servos moving, and I need to ignore the data on either side or in the um, uh, eclipse because we saw the servos kind of hunting around. So that data here is flawed. So if I discount that data and I just look from here back, you could see it's, you know, it's not bad. It's it's around 13. You know, at the start, it was kind of speeding up, you know, as it's tracking, but it's not too bad. So I don't think this is a good, an accurate way of measuring it, but I got data that's not too far off. So it was, it was kind of interesting to see that uh, uh, the data wasn't too far off. So if I was ever to do this again, you know, calibrate the position of your tracker so it knows where the horizon is and where, you know, the sun comes up. So that way I could track uh, the position of the sun. So now let me take, I show you, take you through the, the images. So uh, the camera took uh, over 3,700 images and all I did was I dumped it into a uh, film strip so it plays out as a video and so here you could see the image now one of the things i'm disappointed in was how terrible this came out because look at some points you're almost seeing a circuit board and i i couldn't understand what the hell's going on but you could see it's tracking the sun the sun's in the middle and uh, this is just it's sped up it's speeding up so as we get closer to the eclipse You'll see we're getting close to the eclipse here. And you'll notice something here. You see it's getting dim, 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 dim right there. Look, see how it's bouncing around? That's that's the tracker trying to lock on. It's losing the signal, and that's we saw that data bouncing around. Here it's coming back, and look, it's bouncing around. The camera is, the, the the platform is moving around and, and it's trying to acquire the sun. So I was kind of disappointed in this data, but hey, what do you expect for like a $10 ESP32 module with a little cheap little camera, right? But uh, so it gave me good data and that's just what it looked like. So I, just, I thought, okay, well, what the hell's going on? Look at, if I look at both my ESP Cam32, which was in my, taking pictures of the pinhole camera, which I'll show that in a second. And the picture quality was much, much better. And I compared it to my uh, W Rover module. You know, the only difference was this was using XGA um, uh, uh, resolution, and this is using UXGA. So the only thing I could figure out is maybe UXGA is, is it's not a good, uh, uh, resolution to use, maybe I should have gone back and used SVGA or XVGA or VGA, and maybe I would have gotten better pict pictures. So, I, I, and uh, also too, everything else in the camera was identical. That was the only change. That's the reason why I was showing you that. The, on the only change was just the resolution. So I think it's, uh, you know, I need to better uh, check these camera uh, resolution because prior about a week I got this all working a week before the eclipse and in that week I was in I was overcast the sun wasn't out so I couldn't really test it it was raining a lot the sun came out on the on the day that I was leaving so I, I could go out and do some quick tests but again I couldn't go and change things so I just didn't have enough time I wish I had more time where I could properly test out the cameras to make sure they were, they were working. So here's the image of the pinhole camera. Now, some of them, the pinholes, I, I'm not very good at making pinholes, <laughs> but if you take a look at some of them, the ones that are which kind of roundish, you know, if, if you look at those, you will see that they do get uh, deformed. 
Uh, the camera took over 3,500 pictures. And again, I put it into a film strip. I put all 3,500 pictures in a movie and I sped it up. So it only takes uh, to see the whole thing. It takes like two minutes, right? And uh, as you go along, now you see it moving around like that. That's me moving the box. That's me moving the pinhole camera. So you see it's coming along. So it's like some of them are, are deformed. You ignore that. That's just me. But this hole here is circular. And as it goes along, you know, you'll see it. It's getting deformed as we go along. And where's the eclipse? The, the full eclipse is around. Geez, where's the eclipse? Should be around here. So, oh, yeah, right right here. So here it's going into the eclipse now. It's it's going into C2 at this point. And you can see it's really getting distorted there. And so right here, it's in C2, it's total eclipse. Right here, it's in C3, it's coming out, and you can see it's deformed. So it, it worked okay, but again, I think I wish I had more time to test this out. The problem is, how do you test a, an eclipse to see the deformation without having an eclipse? So that was that was one of my challenges. Um, so you know, I, one of the things I need to uh, you know properly test the pinhole camera, but how? You know, I, I could maybe make better pinholes maybe check it to make sure I'm getting better uh, images coming out. So I, that's it. That's all I have to say. I'd just like to leave you with this quote uh, about Chuck Yeager. And this is Chuck Yeager. Uh, Chuck Yeager died in 2020. I don't know if you guys know who Chuck Yeager is. He's the guy that broke the speed of sound at uh, Edwards Air Force Base. So uh, part of the whole uh, X series, you know, flights using the X1 and X15. And stuff, and uh, he, you know, it's the quote says, "You got to push yourself. You got to know your boundaries and push your boundaries." And that's the way you evolve. That's where you get smarter. And with me, I, again, I pushed myself here, and I made I made mistakes, but boy, did I learn a lot by by doing this. And this is how you learn. So I encourage people to push the bound boundaries. Do a presentation about something you know absolutely nothing about, because you will learn in the process. So at that point, I will close this off and I will take questions.